this is a section. This is what I decided to do. There are so many components to resell. I'm going to do separate modules. Now, how to sell furniture, as you can see, is session one. There's going to be three more sessions. Uh, session two would be working the smalls. Session three, working the larges, which is, you know, your dining room sets, your bedroom sets. And session four, recreating, repurposing. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to be covered in these four sessions. And with that, let's rock and roll. What is furniture? I know it seems kind of crazy. When I was putting this together, I struggled a little bit because I was like, where do I start? Because furniture is such a vast category. So I mulled it over for a few weeks and then I said, I'll start with the people that trained me. I feel fortunate that I had some mentors that took me under their wing because I got started in the commercial contract furniture business, which is office furniture to you. It's that stuff that you sit in when you go to Outback or to a nice restaurant. That's contract furniture because it's built more robustly than home furniture because a chair in a restaurant may see more use in a month than the chair in your house will see in a lifetime. So it's built to be more sturdy and thicker. I mean, there's, there's a difference. And you will see some people that will use residential furniture for commercial applications. And that's when you're sitting at the chair and it's wiggling and stuff <laughs> and buy contract furniture because a bar stool may be four to 500 bucks Whereas they can go to the store and get one of those residential stools for 95. But the thing is, they're going to replace that stool eight to 10 times or more. Whereas if they went with the contract office furniture, it would have lasted a lifetime. So my mentors trained me because we were a boutique contract office furniture firm. We did boardrooms, we did auditorium, we did everything. And we dealt with a lot of law firms, insurance firms, which like that traditional look for the reception room and the conference room. So there was a mixture of antiques, contemporary furniture. So I got a really, really good basis. So I'm gonna just take you through how I was taught and we'll go. So. There's uh, many different classifications of furniture. First, we'll just go with antiques. Antiques is a huge category and classification by itself, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna talk about what you more than likely will find out there. You can possibly come across high-grade antiques. High-grade antiques are things with provenance. That's a chain of possession and ownership that can be traced back to when it was created. The provenance is 90% of the price sometimes. So it's very, very important. But most of the stuff that you will find will not have a provenance and that can be problematic. But you can still sell it for good coin if you can get it cheap enough. There are many people who think that I hate antiques and I hate collectibles. That's not the case. It's just when I dedicate a lot of time and energy to something that you're really not going to come across that often unless you make it a specialization. And I didn't want to specialize in antiques because I love them. Sometimes they're really cool. They're very funky. The whole thing of you've got this piece of American history or French history in your house that's two, three, four, five. It's pretty hot stuff. But the thing is, from a selling standpoint, this is where not dealing in antiques as a whole is a problem. Say you come across a piece that's very rare. It has provenance. But guess what? You're not an antique dealer, and it's going to be very, very hard for you to get antique dealer prices because it's a trust issue. It may be real, but whoever comes to it, they're going to try to get it for, as uh, some of my friends like to say, for the low, low, because you don't have that whole experience of walking through a store full of beautiful things. It's just, hey, you've got this antique. You know, if it's something like super special, you know, you might get a million or two bucks for it because... It's so special and it doesn't matter but typically unless you're set up for that stuff it's very hard to get maximum value out of antiques so my recommendation to you unless you absolutely love antiques you gotta have them really be careful with them be very very careful 
Um, don't overinvest too much money in them unless you can get them for dirt cheap or free. Sometimes at estate sales, you can get some really good stuff because they don't know what they have, but be very, very careful. And the thing with antiques, since they're old, they're frequently fragile. Doesn't take much to damage them, and any damage will seriously diminish the coin that you can get. But if you like them, have at it. If you're just kind of like, hey, I'm selling stuff, I want to find something I can sell and make some money, I would say be careful with antiques. I'm not going to say totally stay away from it, but judge, you know, use good judgment. If there's a piece that's worth 500 bucks, let's say they're asking 500 bucks, but you don't know if it's worth, you don't pass it. I know, you know, your gut may be going, oh no, buy it, but pass it. Because the antique game is a dirty, dirty game. There's a lot of fakes, there's a lot of uh, uh, frauds, all kinds of stuff. So be really, really careful. Now, the next classification is mid-century. You've seen this before, you just didn't know what it was. Uh, this is furniture mid-century, 1940s to almost the 60s. Yeah, about the 60s. Uh, it's modern type look, but it's very distinct. It's a very robust period. You, you'll see this stuff everywhere because it's timeless. And that's another thing about these classifications, antiques, mid-century, these are collections that sell over and over again because there's a huge demand for them and they're they're just been put out for so long that people will buy certain styles over and over and over again so understand with mid-century uh herman herman miller uh wakefield um there there is a uh, no there, there's a lot of names that make money but the thing with mid-century is condition 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 if you get a herman miller barco lounger and you've seen it it's that chair with the ottoman and it's really really funky looking but it's jacked up you can still make good coin because someone may buy the frame to repurpose it to refinish it but that takes away from your profit mid-century is very modular very angular very crisp if you've seen the show mad men that's mid-century and i will tell you i bought a storage unit that was full of mid-century desks those metal desks with the, the the nice knobby feet the little stubby feet in the metal drawers and everything uh, i got that at sugar which now is public storage or was it extra space uh it's public it's public storage now because it used to be um yeah, sugar well there was like a bunch of those desks and they were all in great condition. I was able to sell those for fifteen hundred, well a thousand, because one was a little jacked up, but thousand to fifteen hundred bucks. Mid-century in great condition is very, very hot. If it's great condition, it's authentic and it has that weathered look that's still great condition, but you know, when things get old, oxidation, certain things occur. So asset you can that's something else. If you want to get in the furniture game, you could specialize in mid-century only. And mid-century is more than the furniture. It's the accessories, it's the lamps, it's the hardware, it's the artwork. We'll get into that in later sessions, but I'm just giving you the main categories of furniture. Now, mid-century and modern are totally different. That is a Yamaguchi table. I actually got an authentic Yamaguchi table in the storage unit. I thought it was just a really cool-ass table, and there was some other stuff in there. I almost sold that table for um, about 250 because this lady came in and she just went to it like a hawk. She was just like, Shing! and she just circled it like a dog circling its prey. So she knew what it was immediately. And that's one of the things that I learned is to beat in on people when they go to some and just watch their body language. Because she really, I mean, her body language was almost electric. She knew it was something. So she circles it and she's like, 250? Uh, would you take 200? And then, just based on her body language, 250? That's supposed to be 2,500 bucks. What the? I, I'm, somebody's about to get fired, right? Because I'm just like going off. I'm just, she's like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, it's, it's 2,500. That is appropriate for a Yamaguchi table. And at that point, she told me what it was and I didn't even know what it was. So you got to be thinking really quick on your feet to be a hustler because that one almost got away from me. But uh, she did get it for 2000 
which was cool because the unit I got it out of cost 10 bucks. So that made me get into modern furniture because when I worked for the contract office firms, you know, we did a few antiques, we did contemporary and traditional in office furniture, but not too much modern stuff because modern furniture is very, there's two classifications of modern furniture. There's like the Yamaguchi table, um, certain artists like Behringer Lounger, you've seen it. It's that it has the X base and it's a leather back and it just kind of leans. That's actually a piece of modern furniture that's been around a long time. That's why you see it everywhere. You see it in banks, you'll see it in architecture firms. It's a very classic piece of modern modern furniture. The thing with some, the other side of modern furniture is the stuff is so abstract and it's so over the top that it doesn't have long-term practical application. Like this table here, which was designed in 1944, you could put that in your house right now. It'll look good today. It'll look good next year. It'll look good in the next century because it's timeless. So that's the other side of modern furniture. There are some pieces that are timeless that just look good. And that's kind of the same thing with mid-century. It's timeless. It always looks good. So modern furniture, true modern furniture, and there is some uh, overlap between modern furniture and contemporary. Some people get it confused. But for you, to keep it easy, if it's timeless, it's true modern furniture. If it has a modern look, but it's kind of funky, it's like if it's something that you would just get tired of, that's contemporary. You, you Once you start to look at real modern furniture and contemporary stuff, it'll come to you. you you'll, you'll be like, oh. Now, contemporary, it kind of looks modern, but see, like the little nodules, things up there. This isn't something that's going to be timeless. And just looking at it, it's made of something that's called MDF, medium density fiber board. Part, it's not particle board. It's this chemistry polymer. And that's something else that's very, very important that I should give you. Most of the furniture that you will come across, unless it's antique, good quality, traditional and modern, will have a high MDF quality. Uh, content. It may be wrapped in real wood, but the core may be MDF. I found that out with some furniture I was selling that got damaged in shipping and the lady sent me a picture and it looked like an apple or something that was cut. It was wood on the outside and it was something that was not wood on the inside. I was like, what the hell? And did a little research and that's when I found out. Because when you're trying to get a certain look and you're trying to do it and contain cost, MDF is hard to beat because you can manufacture it and when you're buying it in thousands of shiploads of this stuff, it's very, very cheap. So there's MDF, which is not particle board. Particle board is if you leave your glass on the, on the, on the dresser or the table and it starts to swell up, that's particle board. MDF will not do that. But Contemporary is something you've seen. More than likely, you have contemporary furniture in your house unless you have a high traditional furniture content. Because contemporary is just kind of, everybody likes it. It's soft lines, it's round. But that's part of it. Now, this is what's in the White House. And this is what was in the White House in the beginning. And this is what will be in the White House in the next century. Traditional furniture has a strong, strong appeal and presence across the world. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. And if you can get good quality, and I'm going to give you the difference between good quality traditional and poor quality traditional. Like this is great. This is thick. You see the little wheels and stuff like this. This is could be, you know, I can't tell from the picture if it's a replica or actual. Some replicas, you can't tell the difference between the actual piece because it's that good. But traditional stuff is very, very popular. And if you go to a lot of older mansions, this is what you're going to see. And the way that some of these homes are built, that's all that's going to fit in there. And it's kind of the same thing with like bungalows and cottages. They typically like that mid-century look because it just fits the decor of the house. So what you're going to find mostly is contemporary and traditional furniture out there. That's going to be the lion's share of what you're going to find and be able to sell. So let's really break this down. Getting into the furniture business can be fun. It can be. You can get a lot of cheap stuff for your house. But, 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 you got to ask yourself, 
do you like furniture? Because many people do things to earn money. And then they're like, hmm, I don't really like this because selling furniture is going to be a slow sell because of the price points. You know, cheap furniture is still three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars. That's the cheap stuff. When you get to the nicer stuff, and I'm talking about used, I've sold used bedroom sets for twenty five hundred. I've sold dining room sets for twenty five hundred. Even sold a collection of stuff for six grand out of the storage unit. So you can get good coin even today in 2013, 2014 for the right stuff. But you have to ask yourself, do you like furniture? Because I remember years ago, it was in the eBay power seller board. And I was like, I like wood. And I just, I just really like the sense of completion. When I would be the client as a salesperson and they had like a blank space where they were moving it was the beginning of a project. And I can tell you when you go through weeks and weeks of looking at showrooms going around and you, you, you see the finished deal, there's a sense of pride and accomplishment because there was nothing there and you helped them solve problems. I remember one night, this was downtown. I had sold part of a deal. They didn't get the whole deal, only got part of the deal. I got the file cabinets and I got three offices because we had some furniture that the other guy did. So it was still a win, but it wasn't when I, you know, the big win, because that was the difference between making like four grand and making 15. <laughs> so if I got the whole deal, I would have made 15. But I had to show up for the install. And this is one of the things like, you know, just to help you if you're selling furniture, if you sold something very expensive that you didn't ship and it's local, it goes over much better if there's like a small defect of a problem that you can solve on the spot. Because I don't care how many people you talk to, there always can be issues with it. So they were bringing off the filing cabinets, and we got those from Global. Well, someone had measured the wall wrong, and the filing cabinets were a quarter of an inch too big to fit in the space that that was cut out for them. So I'm there, and, you know, this is about to turn into a major clusterfuck. So I'm there and I see the guy sold. He's like, oh, the cabinets are wrong. And he's like, what did you do? And I was like, hold on, calm down. And I went over there to look at the soffit. And lo and behold, the top wasn't filled in. So this, this is what I'm talking about. People don't think. So I went over and I said, oh, trust me, this is going to work out fine. So I go to the installers and the installers don't, you know, unless you got a really good one. They don't do anything unless you tell them because they don't want to catch any blame. So I said, this is what you do. You tilt the cabinet back and you push it in. So it had this really nice flush look and thank God they fit. I mean, it was like tight. The little little sheetrock was kind of falling when they put it in there. But it, once it was in there, it was done. And it was like, oh, that looks very professional. It, you know, and I was like, yeah, we planned it that right. Just bullshit. So I'm sitting there, right? Good thing I had on the green because my armpits would have been wet. But that's the kind of stuff that used to happen when we were selling office furniture. Because there's so many components and parts to it. But for you, you got to ask yourself, are you willing to deal with a high-touch, high-problem situation? Because the thing is, people don't buy furniture. They buy stuff for experiences. When someone's buying a dining room table, they're not buying a dining room table. They're buying something for Thanksgiving. They're buying something for Christmas. They're buying something for that special dinner. They're buying something for that wedding dinner. They're buying for experiences. Uh, ask yourself this. If you bought a house in the summertime, when did you furnish it? Just before the holidays. You may have bought that house in May. You may have bought it in June, July, August. But the big emphasis to get it furnished is the holidays. Furniture sales take off after September, even if people bought houses earlier in the year, because there wasn't this sense of urgency that the holidays bring. Because people aren't buying furniture to sit on, they're buying experiences. And just remember that. So when you're out there, you got to ask yourself, what are you willing to deal with? Now, this is another thing about furniture. Everyone in their head has this ideal of what furniture should cost. I remember I had this guy on Craigslist. He emailed me. He was just like, 
I was told by this furniture guy, even if the stuff was only a day old, once it was sold, it was classified as used, and you should sell it for 15 to 20% off the cost of new. I was laughing because I've sold things, like I said, now the things I've sold at 70% of retail, you couldn't tell they were not new. I actually lied and said they weren't. But you can expect to get 25 to 70% of retail if you're doing, you know, if you're doing well. Now, this is the big killer with furniture condition. I'm gonna give you some ideas. Tables with scratches. If they're faint, you have uh, things you can do to handle that. But deep grouches and stuff like that, it can it can be problematic. It can be very, very problematic. And it's gonna be very much an issue with imports. Because going back to how you can tell the difference between uh, cheap traditional and really robust, the robust traditional is going to be thicker, heavier. When you handle a leg, you're going to feel the heft. It's going to be made of a hard wood. This um, Chinese stuff from Malaysia, it's going to be very light. It's going to be made of like pine or something. Certain woods perform better over time. A lot of um, import furniture is what we call disposable furniture. This furniture isn't designed to last a long time. It's not, it's just not. It's, the, it's, the, it's actually has a life cycle built into it of probably three to, three to seven years. Unless you don't move it. If you put this stuff somewhere and never use it, don't touch it, they'll look good forever. But if you're using it and you have kids, you can expect that stuff to be beat to shit within three to seven years, if not sooner. So that is one of the reasons that many people love used furniture because they can get high quality furniture for the cost for less than new cheap furniture. So you got that thing. But condition, and these are things that will get you scratches, missing hardware can be highly problematic. Um there is no such thing as a unified length between drawer pulls where you put the piece of hardware in and the screws going back. That stuff's all over the place. That's why when you go to antique stores and you see the little glass knobs, because it's just cheaper and easier to do two separate glass knobs and try to find something to fit because you may never find a piece of hardware to fit that stuff ever. And you can sell that stuff without the hardware, but people are going to beat you over the head because you're, you're selling a defunct, deficient product. So understand in the use section, you know, you're going to be trying to get 25% to 70% of use, which means you kind of have to know what the new price of furniture is, which means you're going to have to shop because this is what I saw 2007 when the recession was starting. I had a table set that I sold every day, all day long for 1500 and it just stopped selling. And it just, I was just like, okay, it's been four weeks, hadn't sold anything. No one was turning their nose up. So I go out on Furniture Row, which is a Dawson Boulevard that's changed radically over the years. And I just shopped some new stuff. And I saw, I saw that table set. And I saw it in four different places for $9.99. <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> so you got to know the price of new because the price of new directly impacts the price of used. So, because there, there's a cushion, people don't like, say, going back to my, my table set, I could have possibly sold it for seven, but it was still kind of bumping up. And then you're like, Mr. Customer, you're not paying taxes, we're going to do delivery, you know, so, so you know, you increase the value. But there's no way in the world I'm going to sell something for $1,500 when it's $1,000 other places. So, if you have a piece of furniture that's very close to new, you're not you're not going to get a new price because say it's a thousand bucks and you're like I'll sell it to you for nine fifty. Fifty dollars is not enough of an inducement for someone to buy it from you and have to move them. It's not. It's got to be a sweet spot of inducement. So say it looks brand new, you sold it for six fifty. A lot of people jump on that, but they're not going to jump at eight hundred or nine hundred. They're not because it's too close to the price of new. So when you're selling this stuff. You have to know what the new price of this stuff is or somewhat of, you know, like when you're buying a house and the bank does comps, you kind of got to know what the comps are because understand if you're dealing with a savvy customer, 
they know what the comps are. They've looked at the stuff more than you've looked at it. So you're saying 800 bucks and they've looked at 10 pieces of that kind of furniture and the range is between five and 600. They may tell you, I've seen this or they'll just walk. So it's very, very important for you to have a deep knowledge base of what you're selling and what your, your competitors are selling the same thing for. Because you may not know, but your customer will. All right. So if you are looking to sell furniture and you don't have any, you have to become a furniture hunter. And this and how you get to this, and I'll go a little deeper in other sessions. You, you've got to pick your poison. You got to pick out like what are you going to sell. You can specialize in bedroom sets and make money, make a livable income. You can specialize in mattresses. You can specialize in dining room set. Not as good as bedroom sets because this is what's going to sell. Bedroom sets are going to sell first. Living room sets are going to sell second. Dining room sets are going to sell third. Uh, even before bedroom sets, TV stands <laughs> and entertainment units, they'll sell. But you got to figure out what kind of furniture you're going to sell. Because you got to figure out what you can move. You know, I'll get a little deeper into that in a minute. But what do you want? You know, because this whole thing, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about, the opportunistic hustler and the strategic hustler. If you're going to sell furniture, you got to come up with a plan. You definitely got to come up with a plan because I'm going to tell you a little secret here. If you want to sell new furniture, it's not as hard as you think, especially today. Because when I go to the Paramart, I notice a lot of the people that used to have uh, limits. Like if you're going to buy furniture from this distributor, there the, the floor was five thousand dollars for your order. You had to, if you couldn't get five thousand dollars stuff, they were like, we don't want to talk to you. A lot of those people came off of that where you could buy a piece. Didn't matter. Sale was a sale. That's how hard this recession hit the furniture. But what you will need is your business license. You'll need a resale certificate, a business checking account, business card. And for some distributors, they're going to want to see your lease and your business license is going to have to have something like furniture or something. You can use the word design. That will also work. So you can get those things together and submit them to the furniture distributor and buy furniture. Now, the thing is, they're not going to sell the furniture to you at a price that you can make a killer profit because let me tell you the difference of how, why I didn't open up a furniture store because I thought, I, you know, that was kind of what's going to happen after I got sick. But when I really sat down, I crunched the numbers and I looked at the data and said, hell no. When you buy some furniture from a distributor and you, you're not a big customer, you're not going to get a big customer break. So say there's a bedroom set. Bedroom set's 700 bucks, right? Well, if you buy it by the container, same exact bedroom set, same furniture from the same place, could be $300, but you got to buy 20 at a time. So understand, you can get certain things, but you're not going to get that big break because all of the big boys are doing container loads. So they can sell that furniture for less than what you bought it for to get rid of it and still make a profit. So that, that's something you have to be very, very careful, careful of. Now, this is part of the hustler mindset thing. If you're a true business owner and you make a goal of selling furniture, but for some reason it doesn't work out, but you still have all your connects where you can buy stuff for yourself wholesale, not exactly a bad thing in my mind. Now, some of these distributors will check your ass out every year to see if you're still selling furniture. If you're not, they will cut you off. Uh, but the higher end people haven't cut me off for some reason. I don't know why. All the low end people, uh, Coaster, Acme, Pound X, yeah, uh, yeah, God. Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody in their mothers is selling that stuff. But the high end stuff, I can still get that stuff all day, every day. So understand, that's what you're dealing with. But you got to come up with a strategy and you've got to come up with a furniture uh, acquisition plan. What are you going to sell? Where are you, gonna, you know, you, you got to come up with that because I'm very bullish on furniture because you can sell a few pieces and make a serious income per month. And a few pieces being six to 15. Whereas you can sell three or 400 pieces of smaller stuff and still not make half the money. 
Uh, and that's something else that we're going to talk about later on is about moving your price points up. Definitely makes a difference because with furniture, you're going to have to become resistant to failure because a lot of people are going like, no, who are you? You're sadly selling out of your car? Really? And there's other people, I love your hustle, Sally. Here's my credit card. Okay, now this is what you will need for furniture. This is your infrastructure. This is some of the stuff that you're going to need initially. Truck. Let's talk about the truck. Pickup truck in the beginning will work fine. Even if it rains, that's what makes tarps. So you can do that. You'll need moving blankets. Let me give you specific instructions here. Have you ever seen somebody moving a dining room table or some kind of wooden furniture with the stuff in the back of a pickup truck going down the highway at 80 miles an hour and there's no blankets? There's maybe some string and twine tying the stuff together so it doesn't fly in the truck. Every bump they hit, that furniture is rubbing together. It's creating scratches. It's creating gouges. It's creating divots. This is another reason people have to buy furniture a lot because people do not know how to move furniture. So if you are moving wooden furniture before you take it from wherever it is, you will take a move in the blanket. If you need two, take two, put those blankets over it and get yourself some strength wrap and wrap it around some tape and then move it. Never, ever move wooden furniture unprotected. It's too easy to damage and each scratch could cost a scratch. One scratch could cost you hundreds of bucks depending on where it is and how bad it is. On the side, something faint, eh, not so much. But what I have seen over and over again with people moving furniture, we you know what I call six-pack movers. You know, hey, will you move my stuff for a six-pack? Sure, bud, I'll do that. Thanks. I'm already drunk and six-pack's enough to take me over all the way to my blood alcohol level to illegal. So don't be that person. And... Sometimes, if you're doing a large buy, uh, one time I bought the furniture from an estate, and I bought everything. Uh, at that point, it may make sense for you to get a moving company to move everything, because they're going to wrap it up, and this is where you got to have space and stuff. But I hire moving companies sometimes for certain things, because I didn't know how to move it, and my moving guys, and you know, my guys, we were good, but we weren't that good. And is, there was enough meat on the bone to pay for those moves because just a simple move can be seven fifty to fifteen hundred bucks. It can be easily, easily. So it's just something to think about. So you'll need a truck, you'll need moving blankets, you'll need some strong help, and you need a furniture repair kit. Uh, that's markers, that's certain polish, that's Howard's. There's, there's just a few things that, like you know, Howard's can help you out. Like, say you get a piece of furniture and it's kind of dull, take, you know, the 000 steel wool and the Howards, take that wool and go all over the stuff. I mean, you know, just the whole thing and then take some paper towels, buff that sucker out and just let it dry. And you'd be amazed at what Howards can do to some old furniture. It's only going to look that way for about a few weeks. <laughs> but it's good enough where they come in the store and they're like, oh, that looks really good. Hey, honey. I need a dresser. Yeah, I like it. So the Howards, was the, it really did a great job for us. You can get the stuff at Lowe's and Home Depot. Howard's uh, furniture stain. And it's just a conditioner type deal. It's not like a hardcore stain. So that's just, you know, and like simple stuff. Um, if you have a dresser and there's a back on the dresser, there's back there for a reason. Because a lot of dressers, unless it has internal support, that piece on the back is part of the support mechanism to keep the thing from falling apart. So you'll need small screws. You'll need a drill. Doesn't have to be the wall or anything, but you know, at least 12 volts, you know, preferably 14 volts. And screws, you'll need wire, you'll just things you don't think of. And this is something that will blow your mind. I used to always ask for the legs of sofas and stuff and units like for some reason. If you ever bought storage auctions, you've seen this. You'll see a unit, and there'll be a nice sofa. There won't be any cushions. They're not in there. They don't know where they're going. I would get those units for little enough and to get the legs because you can take uh, rooms-to-go furniture, or some people used to call rooms-to-throw. Take that sofa and put, like, some uh, Ethan Allen or some high-end furniture legs on them, 
and jack that bad boy up, raise it up about two or three inches higher than it normally is, it looks like a totally different piece of furniture. Totally different piece of furniture. And I'll tell you something else that will clean a sofa and you won't believe it, a straw broom. Just take it outside, take a straw broom, brush everything, get the dust, and you, you'll be amazed at what a straw broom can get out. A straw broom and resolve the stuff you can get at uh, Kroger's or any grocery store. So that's kind of, you know, all that stuff is part of your furniture repair kit. Now you'll need a large space to store and process. And when I say process, if you're going to show the furniture, it has to be set up or it has to be presented in a way that people can actually use it as if it was in their home. You just can't have you know, sofa on top of the sofa and just something else. Never, ever store sofas on their ends. You'll see that stuff sometimes in the big warehouse clubs, but those sofas are not going to be on their ends very long. If you, I've seen it in too many units. You get the sofa and there's like this dent and it takes forever. Sometimes you can steam the dent out, sometimes you can't, but never store upholstery like that. Never, ever put the love seat on top of the sofa or vice versa put them separately do not stack stuff in the cushions because the cushions are made of this foam and if something stays on that cushion for a few months it's going to take that shape and it may never regain its original shape yeah and you will need a merchant account because most of your purchases will be above like you know 20 bucks and it i, I had this argument with a guy on youtube it has been statistically proven by merchant account providers and furniture stores that being able to accept credit cards will literally double your business if you're not accepting them before. That's You have to have some kind of merchant account. Definitely have to have it. So that's this first session. Like I said, there's three more. We're going to get a little deeper in it. And I just felt that you needed to know what is furniture because everyone's like, hey, this is furniture, that's furniture. How do you sell it? And there's so many different things and components to it that you got to ask yourself what component, what, you know, classification of furniture do you even want to deal with? Because it's a big, big world out there. There are people who are doing very well just selling mid-century furniture only. There are people doing very well selling modern furniture. So just something for you to think about. And with that, booyah. That uh, takes me out of there. So let me check and see if we have any questions. <laughs> We've got one question. Uh, this is not furniture, but I'll answer anyway. This is from Isaiah. How much money should I have saved in the war chest to start wholesale it's for FBA or getting inventory by the store charges? Tricky, tricky question. Um, I'm going to answer it like this. As a hustler, period, you need access to at a minimum around fifteen hundred bucks. Because take your money in thirds. You got five hundred to go out and buy what you see to go ahead and reflip and flip. Another five hundred in your pocket in case something special comes along, and another five hundred for incidentals. Now, ideally, you know, five thousand would put you in a serious, serious position to be competitive in the resale world. Because even if you're buying bad, and buying bad means you're just doubling your money. You spend five, you make ten, you earn five thousand dollars profit. That's not bad if you if you need money. Now for FBA, um, getting inventory via storage auctions. I have a different take. If you're doing storage auctions and you find something that you can put to FBA, cool. I would actually source my products for. FBA specifically, I would find some categories that I want to entertain and sell, and I would go look for that stuff. Go to FBA, it's like, hey, this stuff is selling well on Amazon, then go find it. Because with storage auctions, you don't know what you're getting. And you have no clue. And you can spend a lot of money on stuff you can't do on FBA. You might be able to sell it in other channels, but I specifically believe in sourcing specifically for Amazon FBA, specifically. Okay, <laughs> he's laughing, I don't know what that's about. Sure, uh, Isaiah's like, thanks for the webinar. No problem, and like I said, there's gonna be three more sessions. Um, I'm probably gonna double up after Christmas. Uh, to me, New Year's is not this big holiday for me. 
Uh, Because it's going to, like I said, I was talking to someone earlier today. There's going to be a lot more information coming down the pike. And I split this up because it's a lot to digest when I started thinking about all the stuff that I went through with selling furniture. But furniture can be good from the used standpoint if you can get it really, really cheap. Let's see. Are there any more questions? Because I see that one. And sometimes there's a delay before the questions roll in. So with that, while the questions are populating in your head, I'm just going to kind of give you a heads up. Session two, working with smalls. Now, what is a small? That's your lamps. That's your bookcases. That's your edergés. That's the like a fancy name for a curio cabinet or, you know, a baker's rack. That's your dinette tables. That's your uh, occasional tables, which is like you walk into your house and you got this foyer and you throw your keys there. That's like an occasional table. That's your mirrors. There's a huge component called accessories of furniture that you can do very well. So, like I said, accent pieces, bookcases, TV stands. We'll talk about that stuff because those are things that you can kind of flip a little faster. And some of those things you don't need a truck to move. It's like especially lamps and mirrors. And High-end lamps sell very well. That's why you see all these lighting stores that just sell, like, uh, lamps. They sell um, ceiling fans. High-end lighting, very nice lamps do very, very well. And session three, be talking about how to sell and the, the bigger stuff, like your dining room tables, your, um, we'll just be, like I said, selling in marketing of larger furniture. So let's see. Uh, another question from Isaiah regarding furniture selling. When uh, acquiring items, what is your pers- process on purchase amount? How much on the profit should you cost for you to? All right. Uh, I think I know exactly what you're saying. How much money should I spend on furniture? When you're buying right, you're getting it for pennies on the dollar. You, I want you to look at it this way. Your goal is to get the furniture each and every time as cheap as possible. If you're looking at a, a, a living room set and you know for a fact you can get 500 bucks for that living room set, your goal is to get it for 100 because uh, the price that you buy this stuff for, it's never going to change. Something can happen where that $500 goes down to a $400 in a matter of weeks. So... You, you're always looking to get it as cheap as possible. And one of the best ways to get stuff cheap is to buy in bulk. When you go to someone and you're trying to get the best item they have for like, and they know they can sell it for 400 and you're trying to get it for two, that may not work. But if you look around and see like six to 10 other items and say you are from 800 and you know that that's enough stuff to make you 2,400 to maybe 3,000, they come a little, they get a little softer because I want you to understand, average person, Unless, you know, they don't have a checking account and they have to deal in cash. They don't see 800 bucks. I remember one time I paid someone 600 bucks in cash and they said, ooh, I'm a drug dealer. I was like, you are stupid. So get that stuff cheap, cheap, cheap. And let's see, I'm trying to give you a process. Say you are looking for occasional tables. This is, and you have a methodology. You know that you can fix them up, make them look real sexy. And you know you can typically sell them for 80 bucks. So you're trying to get all the occasional tables you can for 10 to 20 bucks. That's you know, and if you can't get it for that, you walk because you don't know how long you're gonna hold on to this stuff. You don't know if you're gonna sell it. You don't know if there's hidden damage. You don't know if you're gonna run into some issues. So get the stuff as cheap, cheap, cheap as possible. And this is when you become that guy. Look, uh, I know your grandmother died on that bed, and it has a lot of money, but I can only sell it for 500 bucks, and I'm offering 150. I've done that to people, and <laughs> it may seem heartless, but trying to be a good buddy to someone and then end up losing money, it could make you heartless for real. So let's see. I was going before I answered that. Yeah, session three, selling, marketing. Session four, that's going to be really different. That's going to be recreating and repurposing. 
I bought a lot of stuff out of storage units that I couldn't sell in the condition that I got it. But sometimes knocking the drawer out and replacing it by glass and turning it into a TV stand can work. Um, sometimes taking the glass out of curios. Uh, just a heads up, if you get a cabinet and it's missing glass, it can be extremely expensive to replace that glass. Extremely. And if it's curved, my uh, recommendation, unless something has changed, just take the rest of the glass out and sell it as a cabinet with no glass. Uh, I've seen people use chicken wire, which I thought was cheesy. I've seen someone do a nice screen job or mess job, but it's not the same. It's just if the glass is gone, it can be ridiculously expensive to replace. I'm telling you. So be very, very careful with that. All right. So that seems to be all the questions for this session. All right. What I'm going to do is wrap it up uh, and hustle you. I will post the dates because all this stuff's probably going to come after Christmas. Well, I mean, it's definitely coming after Christmas because not too many people are going to be around. But I will, like I said, double up these sessions and I will continue with all the things that are going on. So this will be pretty, pretty robust when I'm done. So let me check before I uh, shut it down. Okay, that looks like this. all the questions. Uh, I wanted to say thanks to everyone that came out tonight. Appreciate your time. This is Glendon Cameron, and I will see you on the good side.